Before we get into today's video, I do wanna let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody, anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, Y'all already know, uh, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. So how has everybody's year been? It's 2021 so far, how's everybody's year been? Has it been good? Has it been rough? Has it been rocky? Has it been exciting? Has it been boring? What's it been like? I'll just let you guys know right now, my year's been pretty interesting, okay? I had a lot of plans for this year and although I've been working on some, I swear I've had just like in my life and my family's life, we've had boom, 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 one thing after another and we're not even halfway through the year yet. So yeah, pray for me. I'll pray for y'all. Yeah. Speaking of prayers though, by the way, today's video is going to be the story about John List and John List is the man who completely annihilated his whole entire family in order to save their souls. Yeah, he did it for the good. He did it for their benefit. He did it because he loved them. <sighs> Have y'all heard about this story? Let's just start at the beginning. John Emil List was born in September of 1925. He was born to his father and his mother, who was also John List. His father's name was John List, and his mother's name was Alma, Alma List. Now, John grew up in a very, very strict Lutheran household. They went to church all the time. They were very involved in the church. He was a single child. His father, John Sr., was described as like a quiet but strong man who did not show his emotions like ever or at all. And it is said that John List took on that trait of his father's where he was just very quiet did not show his emotions and kind of just like how I would describe it going through the motions of life. You know, if you don't have any emotions, you just kind of like. Now his mother Alma was described as she was also very strict, but she really babied John. Like she kept him under her wing. She didn't really allow him to have any friends for fear of them influencing him or him becoming like the world or him sinning or anything. So she just like kept him with her at all times. And because of this, John became a major mama's boy, a major, major mama's boy, which ain't nothing wrong with that, y'all. I'm a, I'm a boy mom myself, but he, he didn't have any friends. It was his mother was his only friend. Now, when John was younger and still living at home, he was active in his church. He would help teach Sunday school and stuff like that. And then just spend the rest of his time at home with his family, reading his Bible. And that was about the extent of the excitement of his life. People that knew him when he was younger described him as just like socially awkward and quiet and, you know, kind of like a loner. Now, as he got older, when he finished with school, he went into the military. He actually went into the army right around the time of World War II, and he went in as a laboratory technician. In 1944, John's father passed away, so at this time now, John just has his mother, Alma, and, and in 1946, he is discharged from the military, and he enrolls in a university, and at this time, he's going to school to work on his bachelor's degree in business administration, but at the same time, he was also working on his master's degree in accounting. So he was a numbers guy. He was a numbers guy. He wore suits all the time. It is rumored that like he would literally put on a full suit to go to the grocery store to get milk for his mama or some eggs or some flour, honey. Like he was that type of guy. He had his glasses. You know, he was very polite, very, you know, well-spoken and nice, but, you know, just quiet and 
described as awkward. In 1950, John is called back into the military because of the Korean War, and at this point, he is sent to Virginia. And while he was in Virginia, and he was going to church there as well, he started like going to this like singles groups, and he meets this woman named Helen. Now, Helen was beautiful, you know, goes to his church, is in the little singles group with him. However, Helen did have a daughter, a little girl named Barbara from her previous marriage, and she was a widow. Her husband had actually been killed on active duty in the war himself, and so she was just a young, single widow mom at this point. John was nervous as he started to date her to introduce her to his mom because his mom, first of all, it is said that he was nervous because she had a daughter and she wasn't, you know, she'd already had a daughter, but however, she had a daughter, but she was like married. She had a daughter to her husband. You guys got to remember, this is 1950. This is, this is 2021, right? But anyways, that he was nervous to tell his mom because of that. I think he was nervous because he was such a mama's boy that she may, you know, you know, sometimes, sometimes mamas, they don't want nobody to date their son, their babies, you know why. But anyways, he was nervous to tell her. So they were dating and spending a lot of time together. And the next thing you know, Helen tells John that she is pregnant. And John's freaking out a little bit with his quiet self in a suit, probably like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What if she's pregnant? She's pregnant. So he does what any sensible church going Lutheran man would do back then is he married her. He married her because he didn't want to have a baby out of wedlock. And at this point, however, he marries her and he's with her for about two months as her being his bride. And she tells him, oops, I was wrong. Um, yeah, I wasn't really pregnant. And so this actually, you know, and he believed that once you get married, you stay married. So now he's married to her and he's, you know, helping take care of her daughter at this point and he's married to a woman that he kind of feels like he was tricked into this marriage and so John started building resentment towards her. He also did not know at this time that Helen had syphilis. Now Helen had gotten syphilis from her husband you know, the one that had passed away. And it is said that like back then, syphilis was more common. It was not unusual for men that were like in, you know, in the military or in the war or whatever that would go around. And when they were like out on tours or stuff, they would sleep around, they would get prostitutes. I mean, I know not all men, but you know, it's whatever. And they would bring these diseases back to their wives. So she had syphilis, but it is said that it was in like such the advanced stages that John never caught the syphilis, but she had it and it was actually eating her from the inside out. And he didn't know it at this point. In 1952, John was able to find work as an accountant in Detroit. Now they had moved around a lot and he had had multiple different jobs. It's like, it's almost like he had a hard time holding down a job. He could get a job because he was very smart, well-spoken, well put together. But for some, some reason or another, he had a hard time like actually keeping the job. So when he got this job in Detroit in 1952, they were happy. And right around this time is when Helen did become pregnant. Now, eventually they would go on to have three kids together. So she had her daughter from a previous marriage and then they had three children together. In 1960, the stepdaughter, Barbara, she gets married and she moves out of the house and leaves John and Helen and the three children. And right around this time, they end up moving to New York so John can accept another job. So now they've gone from California at some point to Detroit to now New York and he's just like bouncing around you know looking for the next big thing and hoping to like get the next good job. Now at this job he eventually worked his way up to become the director so he was making better money at this point and for whatever reason they decided they wanted to move and they wanted a, a big nice house and it is said that his wife Helen was the one kind of pressuring him to do to get them a much bigger nicer house and they found this 19 bedroom mansion. I mean it was huge. It had an apartment on the third floor, a whole nother apartment with a kitchen and the whole shebang bang you guys like big, giant, giant, nice house. But John knew that the only way that he could purchase this house is if he had help. So John went to his mama. <laughs> he went over to his mommy and he was like, mommy, no, I'm just kidding. He spoke to his mom and he talked his mom into giving them the down payment and moving in the house. And he said that he was gonna move her into the apartment 
on the third floor. So it was kind of like a win-win for both of them. She got gets to be close to her baby boy. I mean, I would do that as a mom. I'm not gonna lie. I love my babies. I'd be like, okay, I'm moving in. I'm just kidding. She gets to be close to her baby boy living on the third floor. She's gonna put down this down payment or whatever. And he's gonna get to live downstairs with his three children and his wife. Now, Helen did not work. Right around this time too though, Helen started doing a lot of weird stuff. It is said that the syphilis was actually getting to her brain and like messing with her, causing like early onsets of dementia and she would have different outbursts and she wouldn't clean the house. And at this point, John was doing actually everything for the kids. So he's kind of taking care of his mother that's living in the third floor, right? He's got three children and he works full time. John would literally be at work, okay? And his wife, Helen, would call him and be like, you're a piece of crap, you're this, and just like have these like random outbursts. And then she would hang up or then she would call him and say, your baby's crying, you need to change the diaper. You need to come home from work and change the diaper. And there were times that he would actually have to leave his job come home and do something for the children. But every day when he got home from work, he had to clean the house, you know, make sure the kids had baths, make sure, you know, food was made for the kids. Like he had to do everything. And the resentment towards his wife continued to build, 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 and build. It is said that because Helen's syphilis was like, destroying her from the inside out that there were she would not get out of bed for days she'd get up in the morning she'd make her coffee she'd maybe grab some food or something like that and then she would go back to the bed and then like i said she would call him while he was at work because she would have these different outbursts and he was just building more and more resentment towards her over time but he was so quiet that you couldn't really tell. The neighbors actually said that John would mow his grass in a full suit. Like, can you guys, can you imagine this? This is like <laughs> the guy, like he's doo -doo -doo, mowing the grass in his full suit. And then he would take his kids to church with him. And also around this time too, Helen quit going to church at all. So he was worried about her soul at this point as well. She's not going to church. She's calling him, cussing him out. He's the one taking the kids to the church, mowing the grass in a full suit, going to get milk and eggs in a full suit and doing it all. In 1966, John lost his job and he was just too embarrassed to tell anybody. I mean, I really could imagine how he felt, especially since his wife was like attacking him in the ways that she would. I mean, she would purposely, she knew he was inse insecure and she had these health issues that was messing with her as well. And so he didn't want to tell her that he had lost his job. I mean, they're living in this big old giant mansion. And so he hid it from her and his mom and his kids. He would get up every single morning. He would get dressed in his full suit for work. And he would go down to the train station and he would sleep on the bench or he would grab some food or he would, you know, read the newspaper and pretend to go to work and then go back home. And he did this for a while. There was different, you know, times in between this that he would like find another job and he would get it and he would lose it. He would get it and he would lose it. It is said that because he was so quiet and insecure that he had problems keeping jobs. Like if he had a job and they promoted him to director like they had before and he had a position where he had to fire somebody or like reprimand somebody, he couldn't do it. He would freeze up. He just wasn't that type of personality. And so he just struggled in his positions. As the money continues to deteriorate because he's not working, he started sneaking into his mom's bank account. I guess some way, somehow he had access to her bank account, I'm assuming because that's her son and she trusted him. And so he would steal money from his mom to pay bills just to keep them afloat. And the whole time the kids had no idea what was going on. In October of 1971, by this point they were drowning in debt. You guys, this is five years later from that original job loss. Like what was he doing for five years? Like holy cow, okay? Anyways, they're drowning in debt and it is rumored that maybe the kids and the wife and them kind of started to pick up on something because his two oldest children, his son and his daughter, they went and got little jobs and they were giving all of their money to their dad. So basically, he was paying the bills with his kids' work. So his kids are going to school 
and then coming home and going to work. At this time too, John really started getting concerned with his daughter that she was going to lose her soul and go to hell. And I've seen conflicting parts of this. I saw that she was dating, like she was in high school at this point. She was dating a 21 year old man and he suspected that she was doing drugs and like drinking and stuff. And she also um, joined, and this was for sure, she joined the drama class in her school and she wanted to be a movie star when she grew up and John was freaking out. He he just thought people that do movies and acting like, oh my gosh, that's the devil. She's going to go to hell. Like he was, so the stress on him is just piling and piling at this point. Because of that stress, John gets it in his mind that he is the one that brought the sin into his family because of him losing his jobs somewhere, somehow over the rainbow. He read something, thought something, got it in his spirit, however, that poverty is a result of sin. So he must have, you know, or, or poverty was sin. Whatever it was, it was sinful and it was his fault. And so he started thinking the only way to save his family was to kill them all so they could go to heaven while they were still saved so they didn't lose their salvation. I just got myself so convinced that this was what I had to do that I was going to go through with the whole program. And he had considered taking his own life. Like, why not just take my own life, cut myself out of the equation since I'm the sinner. But he believed that if he killed himself, that was the most unforgivable sin and that he would immediately go to hell. So his only option was to kill everybody else. And I know that that's a thing because I believe that too my whole childhood growing up, that if you kill yourself, that is the one and only unforgivable sin. And... That actually saved me from some stuff when I was a kid. I'm not going to lie, but that's another video. So he started planning in his mind of how he was going to kill his whole entire family in order to save them. The murders. On November 9th of 1971, John wakes up. He goes through his routine. He gets dressed for work. He sends his three children off to school. After they were gone, I went out to the garage and Got the guns ready. Tried not to act any different than I ordinarily would, you know, so they wouldn't be suspicious. And he waits for his wife to come downstairs to make her coffee. As she's making her coffee, getting her hot water boiling and all of that, she makes her first cup of coffee, sits down to take a sip, and John takes a gun and shoots her in the back of the head. It is said that he shot her from a distance of 18 inches. 18, like, he just, like, straight up, she, sip of coffee, kapow, pff, lights out, like, oh my gosh. So the next thing John does is he climbs the stairs to the uh, third story apartment where his mother is. He opens the door where his mother's standing in her little kitchen, making her some toast and getting her coffee together. He got over and, you know, greeted me and gave me a kiss and I, and she said, what was that noise? At that point, I felt like a Judas having, you know, kissed her too. And I said, oh, it must have been some noise out in the back. That's why I came up. And when she turned around, he shoots his mother dead in the face, you guys. Bang. Like, whoa. John then cleans up the scene as best as he could. He takes his wife's body and he drags her into one of the rooms of the house and he takes a sleeping bag and he puts her on it. He goes upstairs to try to get his mother's body and he says that his mother was too heavy to bring down the stairs so he put her in a sleeping bag up there. He cleans up the scene as much as he can. He makes him a sandwich. He sits down at the table that he just shot his wife in the back of the head at, and he eats him a sandwich. I don't believe that while I was eating, uh, especially at lunchtime, that I uh, had any feelings of, you know, I should stop and not go any farther with this. I just felt that once I had started, it was incumbent upon me to kill all of the children so that not even one of them would remain. And goes on about the rest of his day. Later, John goes to the bank and he closes both bank accounts and takes out all the money that he probably didn't have in his, but his mom had some money in hers. So he, he takes all the money that he has out of his mom's bank account and his bank account and he closes them. Then he goes back home and he starts writing letters. He writes a letter to the school to let the school know that 
His kids would be out of school for about a month because his wife, Helen, she had a family member that lived out of state and they needed to go there and take care of her. He sent letters to the kids' part-time jobs that they had. He sent letters to the church and, and really just tried to make sure that nobody would be checking on the family. Later on that day, his 16-year-old daughter, the one who wanted to be a movie star and wanted to be in Hollywood, comes home from school and he shoots her in the back of the head. He drags her body, puts it in a sleeping bag, and puts it in a room next to his mother. Right around this time, his 13-year-old son, Frederick, comes home and he shoots him in the back of the head as well. Drags his body into the room, puts it on a sleeping bag. So all three of their bodies now are laid in this room on sleeping bags while his mother is upstairs in a sleeping bag. And now he just has one more child to kill. John Jr., who was 15, was actually still at school. So John Sr., John List, drives up to his school. And then after school, he had soccer practice. He sits in the bleachers. He watches his son play soccer. So I went over and watched the soccer game. He seemed to be playing a good game and enjoying himself. And then we came home together in the car. He gets him in the car with him, takes him home. As his son, John Jr., walks in and he drops his backpack on the floor, he shoots his son. Now, this son, this, this child of his, allegedly either fought back or twitched. I watched an interview, which I will leave linked down below, that John listed. He said that he thought it was like a neuro, you know, neurological response where he was just kind of twitching and stuff like that. It was John, I don't know whether... It was a, a muscle reaction that caused him to jerk around a little bit. But then I shot several more times. He ended up shooting his 15 year old son like 10 times, like bang, 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 bang. Can you imagine while your son is like convulsing, he just kept shooting him. Now John List is convinced he did not suffer, but nobody will, you know, really will ever know. He takes his body and drags it and puts it in there next to the other three on a sleeping bag as well. John then contacted the milkman and the newspaper and let them know, do not deliver here for a month. We're going to be out of town. He goes down to the post office and asks them to hold his mail for one month because they will be, you know, out of town. And then he goes back to the house and he makes him another sandwich or dinner. And he sits there at the table and eats while his three children and wife are dead in the ballroom is what it was. And his mother is dead upstairs. Then he turns down the air conditioner all the way down. That way it stays nice and cold in there to try to, I guess, preserve the bodies as long as he could. That was his train of thought. He spends the night. That night, I may not have slept from 100% soundly, but I think I got probably better night's rest than I had the night before all this happened. And then the next morning he gets up, turns the lights on that to make it look like I guess somebody's there, I'm not really sure, and turns some lights off, has that air all the way down. He turns on the music to like a loud classical music, turns it up real loud in the house, leaves it playing, and then he locks the house up and then he leaves. But before he leaves, he goes around to all of the pictures and he rips his face out of the pictures. Now you guys gotta remember, there wasn't no social media, Google photos, none of that back then. I mean, if you didn't have it print right there or the negatives, it, it, it didn't exist. So he rips himself out of all the photos, hoping that they would not be able to make posters looking for him. And then he locks the house up, he leaves, he drives to the airport, he leaves his car parked in the JFK airport, and he hops on a bus and he leaves town. So this was very well thought out. This was very meticulous. And this was a, like he strategized this. This was not just a on the whim type of thing. I mean, to the point of writing letters to the school and, you know, trying to cover all of his tracks. Eventually, I want to say a couple weeks later, one of the lights started going out in the bedrooms and the neighbors got concerned about the mother. They thought the mother was still there. And so they called the cops. So the cops came to the house, they peeked in the windows, they didn't see a sign of struggle, nothing like that. So they went ahead and left and they didn't, they didn't bust in the house or anything. On December 7th, almost a month later, John's 16 year old daughter's drama teacher called the cops and said, I think that there's something up. Now, something that I didn't tell you guys before is 
right before he killed his whole entire family, he was sitting at the dinner table with his family and he started talking to his kids and his mom and them about how they would want to die. How they would want to die. And I mean, you got to think the three kids are like, what? Like, huh, dad? Like, this is a little weird. And he was asking them if they wanted to be cremated, if they wanted to be buried, you know, what did they want it to be quick? Would they want to be shot? Would they want to be drowned? Like how they would want to die. Well, when her, his oldest daughter got to school, she told her drama teacher that she thought her, her dad was going to kill her. She said, I think my dad's going to kill me or kill our whole family. Like he's acting really weird. If we just disappear, you need to be suspicious. And of course the drama teacher's like, okay, <laughs> Dramatic 16-year-old teenager, right? Your dad is going to kill you guys, right? Well, when they were gone for a month and they hadn't heard anything from the whole entire family, the drama teacher really got freaked out and she was like, okay, we're going to go check on them for real now. She called the police and she met the police at the scene. Now, there was a discussion of like if they could go in the house or not. The drama teacher just really pushed it like if there's an elderly woman up there, like she could have fell, she may need help, whatever. So they get into the house and as soon as they walk in the house, they're blasted with the cold air. I mean, it's freezing, okay? And they hear this loud classical music, but it wasn't just classical music. At this point, it was like one of those scary songs, you know, that's like the big organ, like, mm, like it was scary. They were totally creeped out. And so they start walking through the house and they're calling out, they're calling out the kids' names, calling out John's name, calling out Alma's name. They don't hear anything other than this loud music until they get to the ballroom and they see the family laying in the sleeping bags and the cop yells out, hey, can you get up for me? Like, hey, get up. And then they realize that they're not moving. At this point, the cops were, I mean, they were freaked out. They see all of the dead bodies, like they're just lined up in sleeping bags like they're sleeping. Eventually they went upstairs and they found Alma, uh, John's mother's body as well in the sleeping bag and a nationwide manhunt goes out for John List. They found his car and actually a cop had given him a ticket on his car for being there at the airport parking lot, but that wasn't unusual for people to just go park at the parking lot, hop on a plane and then their trip gets delayed or you know, whatever happens. So they weren't suspicious of it until at this point. And so now they were just convinced that he had gotten on a plane and flew somewhere. So they were looking for him to have flown out of town, but actually he just parked there and went and got on a bus. By the time the manhunt went out for him, I mean, he had already been gone for four weeks, almost a month, and he was already 2,000 miles away and was kind of establishing a new life at this point. He took on the name of one of the guys that he went to school with, Robert P. Clark, and he was going by the name of Bob. And when he got to the new place where he was living, which he actually went to Denver, he started working as a cook at a restaurant. So he was just doing whatever he could. So he gets a job as a cook, 2,000 miles away. The nation is looking for John List, but now he is Robert Clark going by Bob and he's just restarting his life. John at this point was living just like what would be considered a normal average everyday life. He was never violent. He didn't get in, you know, any arguments with anybody. He worked. He actually could hold down a job now. And although he had that problem that seemed to have plagued him before where he couldn't hold down a job, he seemed to have left that problem in Jersey where he was previously and then now where he was in Denver, he was holding down a job like it was nothing. John spent the next 18 years, 18 years, yeah, living a peaceful, normal, quiet life. He even joined a Lutheran church there that he was very much involved in. And while he was at this church, he meets a woman named Dolores Miller. He falls in love with Dolores and she falls in love with him and they become engaged. In 1985, they even get married. So she is now married to Robert Clark, Bob, who is actually John List, who is on the run from the police for killing his whole entire family, honey. She thinks she done found her, the, the man of God that she has been praying for at the Lutheran church. Could you imagine? And so in 1988, after being married for three years, the couple moved to Virginia because John got a new job opportunity. Now this is what happened. So he started working as a cook, right? 
Well, as he was working at this business, like the, the owner thought like, wow, like he is a really, you know, hard worker. He's quiet. He always shows up on time. He don't bother nobody. And eventually as they were talking to John, well, Bob at this point, he's told them that, you know, he had worked as an accountant before. So this job gives him a job, you know, running the books there as an accountant. So he's able to work his way up and is doing basically the same job that he was doing in his old life. And so then this, this business owner helps him get a job, a better job in another place. So they moved to Virginia. Now at this time, America's Most Wanted was a huge hit show. Do you guys remember this? I used to watch this and Unsolved Mysteries. I know they've kind of redone Unsolved Mysteries now on Netflix, but it ain't the same, honey. Back when I was a kid, the sounds or the music of America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries would creep you out all on its own. I mean, but you just had to watch it. So America's Most Wanted was a show where they would, you know, talk about people that were on the run. And when a detective came to the guy, John Walsh, who run the show, America's Most Wanted, with the story of John List, originally they turned it down. They were like, this guy has been on the run for like two decades at this point. You don't have any real pictures of him. They did have one one photo somehow some way they got a photo of him from years ago he's probably looks like a totally different person now I, who knows where he's at what he's doing like no we're not going to take on the show but some way somehow they were able to talk them into it and they part of this was and if you guys don't know John Walsh the guy that runs or you know did America's Most Wanted his son was actually killed and murdered and that's why he started the show so like he had an actual you know, emotional connection to these cases. So they found somebody that was going to create like a sketch or a drawing or a model of what John List would look like at this present time, like 20 years later. And so they did, and they discussed it. They talked about the glasses that John once had and that how he would probably change them over the years, but not too much because that was his type of personality. So instead of him wearing like round glasses, now 20 years later, in order to disguise himself, he would probably wear square glasses and that like he would probably look like this and his hair would look like this and they come up with this mold of John list in order to do the show now the weird thing about it though and this is all just so interesting to me John List used to watch America's Most Wanted. I mean, he watched it so much, he talked to his neighbors and would tell them to watch it. And he did an interview where he said he always wondered if he was going to be on it. So he was watching it to see if he was going to be on it. And then boom, he's sitting at home one night after a long night of crunching numbers to watch his favorite show, America's Most Wanted. And here comes his face pops up, John List. They tell the whole entire story. You guys, he's sitting there watching it with his wife and his wife does not bat an eye. John List would later say in an interview that when he saw himself in like the new mold that they did of him, he was even impressed. He was like, it looks exactly like me. Now, he wasn't too much worried about it, but the phone line started lighting up for America's most wanted, like people were calling in tips, all kinds of tips. But the one that particularly struck their interest was one of the neighbor of Robert P. Clark. His John's next door neighbor said that, man, the description that you guys have given, even down to him cutting the grass in a full suit, looks a lot like my neighbor, Robert P. Clark. So they investigated it. They went into it, and in 1990, on February 16th, John List, Robert P. Clark, was arrested on five counts of murder. Now, could you imagine the wife? Now, I didn't tell you guys this part, too. The neighbor actually called the wife and was like, listen, I ain't trying to burst your bubble or anything. I know you married, you newlywed, you got your man of God, honey. You done met him at the church and everything, but he looks like this killer. And she's like, not my husband, not my bae. Girl, could you imagine? They came and arrested him. On April 12th, he was indeed found guilty of the five murder charges and the judge gave him five consecutive life sentences, one right after another, honey. 
If you die, you come in right back to prison. Okay. If you die three times, you, you come in right back. You got five consecutive. He did try to appeal the case on the grounds of having PTSD, but it was shot down. They did do a mental evaluation though, and did find out that he had OCPD, which is a little bit different than just OCD. It's obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So he did have a personality disorder and he would obsess over things. And John never really just straight up accepted that he did anything wrong down to the fact when they came and interviewed him while he was in prison, you know, he still just kind of believed and it was kind of even smirk. Honestly, it, it bothered me. <laughs> It bothered me to watch and he definitely believed that he was going to see his family in heaven one day and that he did what he thought was the best. Like there was no tears or emotion or like, I cannot believe I killed my whole entire family. It was more of like, you know, he did what he felt like he had to do. And it's almost like he couldn't believe that he got away with it for so long. In 2008, John List died in prison from pneumonia. And I just want to know, did his wife stick by his side? Like, can we get an interview from her? Is she still alive? Sis, we need to know the tea. Like, how was he? What did he, like, did he have a gun at the house? I mean, what, I need all of the details. I'm gonna tell you guys what I think. I think that he built resentment from the very beginning. You know, it just kind of reminds me again, like of Chris Watts, right? Of a Chris Watts situation where you have a guy that's passive and he doesn't possibly maybe know how to deal with his emotions. Maybe his mother was overbearing. That's what they say about Chris Watts' mom. I don't know. I don't know her. And for some reason or another, he feels like he has no other option other than to kill his whole entire family. Because, well, because the John List situation too is like, you know, it's the same thing with Chris Watts. Chris Watts had a plan, okay? He was going to restart his life with this new woman. Like, you... With John List, if he thought he was doing this to save his family, he sure did plan it out so he wouldn't get caught. You know what I mean? Like, that's how you know you're doing something wrong. I don't know, you guys. He, watching the interviews of John, it's a very interesting story, but it's so bothersome. So many different layers to it. And so just bothersome. And... So many different cases where people say they do things because of God. And that's kind of terrifying. I mean, you have like, and people that say they do things because of the devil too. I mean, you look at um, Pazuzu, right? Or the Night Stalker, you know, like, holy cow, you guys, just crazy. Have y'all heard about this story? Have you heard about it before? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below. You guys can stay and watch another video. There's plenty for you to choose from. Check out my Chris Watts, you know, playlist, something like that. Stay and watch another video. But thank you guys, as always, so much for watching this video. Please do not forget to like it. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.